Project descriptions, we're gonna look at four project descriptions, three of which are based on actual tax court of Canada cases where the claimant has either gone in and won or lost. And the fourth, we're gonna look at a Canada Revenue Easy example, one of the 10 new examples that they released in December 2012. Now, one of the first things that I like to do if the client doesn't have their own numbering system for the projects, is recommend a numbering system for SRNED that's gonna help us ascertain a couple things. So the numbering system I would use is the first project that started in the 2012 taxation year would be 1201, then 1202, 1203, et cetera. The first project started in 2013, 1301, and so forth because one of the questions that the form now asks is, is this a brand new project or continuation of a prior year project? And the review criteria and the risk criteria are very different. The CRA assumes that if they already approved the project in the prior year, they were happy with the square and triangle, or you wouldn't have got approved at all. Um, so they're just gonna jump right to the circle. The, what did you do? Is it still consistent or is it, does it look like we're in commercial stage? If it's a brand new project, well that's, that's a much higher level. Of, now they gotta go through the whole thing and qualify all the stages of it, right? So again, if you use this numbering system, it's, it's really quick to us. Not only is it new or, or, or old, but also how long has it been going, right? Because again, when it goes beyond three years, that's where the series thing, is this really a project or a program, and asking you to justify it. So here's an outline of what we call our lead sheet, our project cost summary. We'll have projects from 2012, projects from 2013, and then we'll have all the costs, the wages, materials, contractors, and this will go in as part of your course materials. Okay, the first project, Northwest Hydraulics, is the development of a divide well, and they looked at several projects here, but this was probably the, <coughs> the most successful or, or the strongest of them. The one that the judge argued was indicative of an SRNED project and he could not understand how CRA would even let this get to court. Okay, so the objective was to modify or improve existing models. So there were existing models, but they were not predictive enough to the capacities that we wanted. We wanted to improve them to match certain environments. Some of the objectives that went beyond standard practice are reducing bed load, downstream scouring, and reducing the cost of the overall system. Or three of them, and they, there was probably many more, but the case just didn't get into it. Okay. So what they claimed in the courts and they went on was that they said the uncertainty in related advancement was the optimal method to both sense and control temperature. Okay. And then what they looked at variables for, um, sorry, I think that's the wrong term in there. Um, geometry of upstream training dike spurs, alignment of shapes for the input. Okay. So the different structures, do they use a weir, a sluiceway, a headgate, an ejector? So each of these would have different physical parameters, and they're saying there's models for each, but it's not clear, based on the overall dynamics of our environment here in the river, which of these would go in which geometries. Okay? So you'd have a general model, but they're saying this isn't meeting all of our objectives on sedimentation or whatever our performance objectives are, and we think we can take that model and improve it some way. And like I say, these guys were, were professional engineer PhDs, so they tend to be very good at dealing with theoretical models. Again, usually not the kind of claim that Siri would typically challenge, but these days there's really <coughs> a lot of this. So they actually outline seven different activities in here, going from baseline testing, upstream training, low, flannel, low flow channel development. They look at the performance of the, of the intake. They look at different things coming down, like logs and how they would extract it, something called a stilling basin and a settling basin. And, problems with each of those, plus issues on the design of one component here that would have upstream or downstream effects on the other, our system uncertainty. Okay, I talked about a key criteria summary. So the thing that I want to use, instead of reading a five-page description, is to say very quickly, when I look at a key criteria summary, so our, our engineers will work with the client, and I might just do a final glance before it goes out. I don't want to get in to all the details, because our engineers are the specialists in that field, I want to look at things. So if the benchmark section is blank, I have a problem. I don't, I don't care what field you're in. If that benchmark section is blank, we've, we've left ourselves open to say we didn't benchmark standard practice adequately, right? So what do we do? Well, 21 articles, five patents, one competitive product. Is that reasonable? I don't know. I'll look at the total costs at the end. 
and say, well, you know, for this many man hours, that, that might be good enough. Okay? If, if I'm suspect, I'm going to go read the description. I'm going to start asking, you know, what, what else? Maybe I'll even start to do my own searches and see if I can find something. So the next thing is, do we have quantifiable objectives? Well, in this case, yeah. We want to decrease bed load disposition, um, reduce downside scouring, and reduce cost. I'm going to provide some numbers to that. They didn't in the court case, so I've just made these up for theoretical numbers. And most importantly, what are the variables that we're going to experiment with that we think are not provided to us routinely on an existing model? We can't just say, well, I'm going to use the alignment and intake shape of this model and it's going to work. If I can say, well, this recommends a nice intake shape, but I'm still going to have to experiment with it because of other factors, well, now I've created my system uncertainty. So what are those? Uh, so the input intake shape, um, geometry of the dikes and spurs, we talked about those settling basin geometry, et cetera. And these scientists in this case may, made enough of a reasonable argument that those were not predictable based on existing models and that they had to do the experiments that the judge, based on the evidence, agreed that these were clear system uncertainties. So the last part is, how do I know that the costs that they claimed are reasonable? So for each of the activities, what do we do? Did we do trials? Did we do analysis? Did we do actual physical prototypes, which would have materials and, and additional costs in them? And then assume that someone skilled in the art, if they have a general idea of what we're doing, would be able to say that looks plausible or this looks very unreasonable at that point, in which case they're going to have a site visit. Okay? So at the end of the day, we have results here. And the other thing that I look at is which variables did we conclude on? So I've done a little trick here where I've, I haven't concluded on any. So my first question is I come in and I ask them, why did you not conclude on any of these variables? Okay. So ideally, we'd want to see a conclusion on at least one or more variable. If we made a conclusion on even one of those variables, we've got technological advancement, even to say it behaves differently than we expected. Okay. Gentel. Gentel is a case where the company lost. Okay. A recent one, probably in the last three years. And what happened was um, they, they made furniture products, shelves, tables, things like that. And they wanted to minimize loads, costs, and assembly times. If you read the description that they submitted, you can see why they lost. They, they really didn't provide enough detail to say that there was experimental development or that it was scientific in any way. Um, so I know this is very small, but I'll try to read out what I've got. So I've got two columns, negative indicators and positive indicators of eligibility based on the Gentile facts from each case. The negative indicators is actually sadly more or less what they provided. They went on the negative indicator column. So how did you benchmark existing technology? Uh, relied, relied on verbal representations of the company's owner regarding the state. We, we don't think there's anything out there. Okay? Like I say, your opinion without evidence in court isn't, and, and the research and technology CRA reviewers opinion without evidence, the courts have said, is worthless. That's not what they're looking for. They're looking for you to find the evidence that supports the variables. And you'd need a scientist to understand that, but to find that evidence and then to provide it or admit that the evidence isn't there, one or the other. It either is or isn't, but that's all you're supposed to do. You're not, you can interpret the evidence a little bit, but the judge actually makes the final decision about whether it's in or out. So again, you feeling that there was nothing is not the same as the client provided specific evidence of known technology limits via articles, basically all the things that we said, competitive product, any of those. Okay? So that was missing. Strike one. Objectives. Testing known plastic characteristics versus known production techniques would generally, you know, kind of what they talked about. So I'm saying ideally we provide quantifiable objectives. So um, where are we going beyond standard practice? Are we doing different configurations for structural integrity? Uh, effects of different plastics and melting conditions. Additives or reagents. So they were forming plastic and molding it and, and making stuff, you know. So there's all kinds of potential uncertainty in that process, but they didn't, they didn't outline any of it, right? Uh, modifying, extrusion, or forming techniques um, on different plastic chemical, for different plastic chemical characteristics. Any, anything like that, where you say, here's the existing model, here's what we're doing different. It would have been in. Okay? The uncertainties, they didn't really talk about any formulation or process formulations or comparatives. So they didn't say, we're taking this base formulation and we're changing it somehow. 
they didn't get into those details, right? I'm saying, you know, an ideal description, or ones that I've seen that are successful for similar kinds of work, would say, you know, they had a matrix of variables um, that describe different hypo hypotheses, right? So things like temperature of the melt, mix time, order of the reagents, types of reagents, rate of cooling, etc., that'll affect the final parameters. So again, if you're getting into the, the why does something work, you're good. If, you know, you do the, the client say, well, we tried three alternatives and, and number, number two is the best, that's a result. That's the business advancement. And unfortunately, that's what the client was, was providing. Okay? So they talk about redoing the bin and the front and back panels of some piece of furniture. So, you know, were alternative designs contemplated? They say they tested three methods used on similar parts, um, but they didn't really make any acknowledgement about why did they perform What was different about those methods? Why did they even work? They just said, we tried three different methods and number two was the best, right? You know, an optimal description say, you know, we did 170 samples, we look at combinations of back pressure, maximum temperature, pressures, mix time, speed, anything, any of the variables that we talked about and made a conclusion uh, about one or more of them that wasn't known at the start, okay? So an example conclusion is, you know, high temperature melt fibers prove optimal, but only if we held max temperature to 300 degrees and increased mix time by 40. That, that, that would qualify. That's, that's a good technological advancement, not readily apparent to someone <clears throat> in the art, assuming we've benchmarked standard practice. So again, they say they used eight different plastic materials. So again, they said we used, these are, they used eight different plastic materials. So we got some evidence of experimentation. So you take a well, you know, positive indicator, they just didn't close the loop. They didn't make the conclusions on them. So I'm saying, well, what did they analyze about it, right? So viscosity, whatever, any of those variables, again, if you tried it back to that, the why did it work? Again, they focus more on the results. This worked, we're happy, we're going to the next stage, rather than the conclusions. So the results are, getting to this point or getting to the results are like running a whole marathon, 26 miles, but then not doing that last quarter mile, you know, like quitting right at the finish line almost. So they say that they tested two plastics for thickness versus strength. Okay? Found that plastic one was better. That, again, that's a result. So why was plastic one better? Was it embrittlement? Was it flax? What characteristics that weren't readily apparent at the start? Again, if we can take these case examples, because government repealed all its published examples, I'm saying that's a good thing. Forget about the government's published examples, because in reality, when I look back at them, a lot of them weren't really that good. There was a lot of problems, as the government mentioned. And tax court examples are permanent. The government can't repeal them. They're a tax court precedent. They'll be here 100 years from now. So we can discuss this. And better yet, all the information is public information. So I don't have to worry that something's proprietary. Or if you've disclosed it in tax court, hey, you've, you've made it public, right? Anyone can talk about it. OK. Well, I found that the, the way I've seen it in the courts is that they look at the method. And the, the way to protect that is, again, the due diligence, right? The courts don't ask if the answer was there. They ask if you did a reasonable search for the answer. Maybe you missed it. You didn't have the, it was there, but you didn't have the right keywords. But you did a reasonable search for someone skilled in the art. And, and that's what the judge is going to have to make a call on. And there's going to be judgment involved, right? But I would say that the reality is the courts tend to favor the taxpayer. If you can provide reasonable evidence, they're going to favor you. If you provide no evidence, that's where they're going to have to you know, side, side with the CRA. Oh, sorry, here. Um, so this is one, Air Max, another case where they won. So in this case, the, the individual is developing a whole HVAC system. So you know, air conditioning and heating and going right from the furnace itself and, and the, the air conditioning unit, to the ducts, to the diffusers, to how do we get this, you know, in there. Well, <coughs> um, objectives of reducing footprint, reducing cost, reducing noise, hitting certain air mixing issues, things like that. Now, these objectives weren't actually outlined in the case itself. I kind of made these up to say this is how, this is ideally how this guy really would have hit it through without even going to court in the first place. You know, he wouldn't even have to go there. Um, so again, how can we quantify any of these things where they stack up? That we say, well, you know, we can do all this, but not for 25,000. If we want to spend 50,000, no problem. For 25,000, 
oh, now, now we can't use the same components. We, we might have to do something different. Okay? So create that initial structure of what are our objectives and what standard practice. Okay? They talk about all kinds of system uncertainty issues. So they talk about you know, the coil, its shape, its depth, its location. Yeah, we know how to work with a coil, but the combination of those certain things within the overall system is what's important here. Um, the components itself, which ones do we pick and then where do we place them? Where do we put the diffusers, ducts, boilers, um, <coughs> the furnace itself? Um, the diffuser itself, shapes, aspiration. So again, these guys are stacking variable on variable on variable where changing any one of these could have an upstream or downstream effect. As I said, three or, three or more is the magic number. In this case, we've probably got 12 or 15. So we've got a very, very complex problem that you know, even computers would have problems modeling in many cases. OK. So that client one. Now, the CRA has a project, so the last the project we'll look at, of its published examples. And this is the, their HVAC project, where they talk about, you know, this, could this be an advancement? They talk about getting a cost reduction to $200 a unit. Um, that the, that in it, <coughs> they want an energy efficient recirculation system to permanently remove carbon monoxide. And that the standard practice, or the normal method, the readily available one, uses tin oxide with a platinum catalyst. And they, they don't want to do that for some reason. Who cares why? Cost, health reasons. Some reason they don't want to. That's fine. So the uncertainty is created. And they're saying that even though cost target is not itself uh, an issue, if we need to avoid costly processes, as I'm saying, if I say, well, I can make this machine no problem for 50,000, but if I make it for 25,000, it creates all the problems. Again, outlining all of our objectives that we're trying to uh, achieve is necessary to understand why do those objectives in combination create the problems. Because there's probably no one objective that creates it. It's all of the objectives together. 